Hello, this is Kerry Schutz with MathWorks, and in this video, I am going to cover a two transistor oscillator circuit built up using Simscape Electrical, which is a subset of the Greater Simulate platform. So here's our device under test. As I said, it's uh, consists of two transistors, a NPN and a PNP uh, BJT. Uh, they are connected by way of, well, one's collector to the other's base. And then they're also connected uh, by a couple um, passive components, in R1 and C1, as you can see here. And the first thing I want to do is kind of go through how this circuit operates in principle, and then we'll jump into the actual circuit and simulating it. Um, this circuit was taken, or this example was taken from a website, instructables.com slash tic-tac-tone generator. Um, there are a lot of variations on this circuit there as well. If you're curious, I encourage you to go there and check it out. And then on the right side of this uh, slide, I have some uh, circuit, you know, current voltage waveforms that were that are displayed here using Simulink Data Inspector, as opposed to using Simulink's own uh, built-in uh, internal scopes. So we'll see, you know, how and, and why we did that. You know, there's sort of two ways to view signals. One is Simulink Data Inspector. The other way is is scopes, and they each have their own advantages and disadvantages, like anything else. All right, so in terms of how this circuit works, um, you could say we're assuming that we're starting from some baseline discharge quiescent state. All the capacitors are discharged, essentially both the um, explicit ones like C1 and then the parasitic ones on the capacitors, which you don't see here. So everything here discharged. We apply five volts here at, let's say, time zero. And what we're showing here are the dominant path, current pathways, uh, when that happens. Uh, what we're going to say here at startup is that uh, most of the current goes through the collector of Q2. Uh, that current splits between the base and the emitter of Q2 about evenly, as it turns out. And we're going to assume that C1 is a relative short, uh, as most capacitors would be if they start out at zero volts. Well, even after some short time, they're still at zero volts. Um, and therefore, we've got five volts um, here. We've got five volts at the emitter because there's very low, low voltage drop, let's say, uh, at, across the uh, collector to emitter junction. And we've also got five volts at the base of Q1. So it's on. Uh, that says that the uh, collector is relatively low compared to the uh, emitter of Q2. So Q2 and Q1 are on. and that's our initial state with very little current is denoted by the gray uh, arrows through R1 and R2. So uh, again, uh, all, essentially you could say 100% of the current is through the collector of Q2 that splits approximately equally. And then the cur uh, currents recombine over in the emitter of Q1 with both transistors. However, that, uh, that only occurs over a very, very short amount of time because the uh, the RC time constant uh, through Q1 and Q2 through C1 is very, very short. We've got 10 nanofarads and we've got a very, very low resistance during the on time. Um, the resistance from the base to emitter and from here from collector to emitter, Q2, that, that resistance is very small. So this charge up happens very, very fast of C1. Now, when, it, when C1 is fully charged, as denoted in the figure on the right, then we've got approximately the full VCC voltage here uh, from emitter to base of Q1 and uh, approximately an open circuit at that point. Again, with the full uh, voltage built up across it, as noted here, from plus to minus, from right uh, to left. And therefore, this circuit, you could say, opens up and we're starving the base of Q1 of current. It shuts off, which, of course, starves the base of Q2 of current. And so it shuts off. So, so now um, we're in the, in the off state, and, and now we're going to proceed into the, the next mode of operation of the circuit. Now, um, now I should say when that happens, uh, something interesting happens on C1, and that initially um, there's uh, 5 volts on each side. Shortly after, shortly after power up, there's 5 volts on each side of C1, so 0 volts across C1. Uh, when we shut off Q2, that means zero current through R2. That means zero volts at the emitter of Q2. Uh, and of course, capacitors like to maintain their voltage. So that means 
that if we want to have uh, this five volts that we built up across uh, C1, we need to maintain that for at least a short amount of time. And so if this drops to zero, this, uh, this base of Q1 is going to drop to a negative voltage, a large negative voltage in a very, very quick fashion. Okay, so now that's the state we're in. We're in an open circuit here condition. We've got zero volts here and approximately five volts here. The transistors have turned off. So then what happens? Then we're in the off state. Uh, at that point, R1 through C1 and R2 become the dominant current, becomes the dominant current path because very little current, almost no current is flowing into Q1 or Q2 at uh, the base of Q2. So with the transistors off. Um, and so the dominant current path is red here. When that happens, C1 now charges up in the opposite direction. Before, uh, we had C1 charged up uh, with plus to minus from right to left. Now, with the current going through R1, through C1 to R2, the capacitor is charging up from left to right. That is going to be a much slower charge-up process since R1 is much larger than any other resistor in this circuit. And so the RC time constant is <clears throat> correspondingly larger, and which means it's going to take <clears throat> a longer time for this base uh, emitter junction uh, to achieve uh, a forward bias of like approximately the turn on volts of about 0.7 volts. Because remember, it's going up from the large negative voltage of about minus five up to about 0.7. So you could figure out that that time constant and that would be the off time of these uh, transistors. So. But eventually, that charge will reach 0.7 volts. This transistor will turn on. That'll lower this voltage a little bit, which will turn, turn, turn on Q2. And then we're pretty much back to where we were at the startup, where the dominant current pathway is through uh, the collector, through C1, through Q1. And that, again, charges up C1 in the other direction. And we end up at this state. And then again, we're just cycling through these states back and forth. One thing I'll point out is that if you were to insert a series resistor in, 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 um, in series with C1, then you could alter these, uh, you know, charge discharge cycles uh, as well as R1. So all of these resistors are going to, I mean, have and capacitors are going to have impact on the charge discharge time, particularly R1, C1. R2, R2 here, we're assuming it's really not changing because it, we're assuming it is, it is a load resistor. So we're kind of just assuming it's fixed for purpose of an, an, analyzing the circuit. All right, that's about all I want to cover for the uh, circuit operation. I'm going to give a quick run of the circuit, and, and then we may break this up into two recordings if it you know, becomes too long. All right, so I'm going to run this circuit for five milliseconds. Again, this is our Simulink uh, you know, environment or model, but it's built predominantly using these SimScape electrical components. So I am going to hit play, run for five milliseconds, and then we see these pulses um, every so often. And if we were to just um, take a quick measurement of the frequency, which we can we can do, um, it says down here at the bottom that these pulses occur about every, uh, well, at a 1.367 kilohertz clip, or we could also, of course, measure their spacing and get one over that to be the, the period. Um, in fact, I'll just do that real quick. We will. Just take those and just spread them out a little bit. Maybe put one about there, put one about there. We could zoom in and get it more precise. It's not that precise now. Uh, we have one over delta T is about one point, you know, four kilohertz, and that delta T value is 726 microseconds. And again, we could go in now here and change the frequency by changing, let's say, this, and we would make it faster. Uh, we could make it 53 and say, okay, that should be about twice as fast. The pulses should, should occur twice as often. And we run it for five milliseconds. Again, you see they do. Okay. So I'll just change that back. Uh, 100 E3. Um, and then we could start playing games with trying to impact the duty cycle. Or, you know, since it's right now, it's just pulses that are occurring at a certain clip. Let's also go in and zoom and look at the startup behavior of the circuit. So we're just going to zoom in on that initial pulse and we're going to see that that on time is very, very short. We could also measure it, but we can just eyeball it here and see that it's about 
um, two point maybe six e to the minus seven. So that's about a quarter of a microsecond for the for the on time, and then the off the uh, the off time, of course, is you know on the order of a millisecond or so. So you can see that you know that duty cycle is very very short. And in fact, we saw what the duty cycle was over here. It's telling us the duty cycle is just 0.0, it's less than a tenth of a percent, okay? So again, we can change all that, but we're, gonna, we're not gonna go through all that here in this recording. Um, so what we're gonna do in a follow-up recording is do more analysis of the circuit in a hands-on sense, in, the, in other words, using simulation and then looking at different waveforms using Simulink Data Inspector. Kind of wanna, wanna keep it short here, um, so the next video, again, will focus on running and looking at different current and voltages in this circuit using Simulink Data Inspector.